Yeah. Is it recording? Mm-hmm. Yes. And we are live. Good yeah. afternoon, everybody. Happy World AIDS Day. <laughs> December 1st, 2022. And the World AIDS Day theme this year is putting ourselves to the test, achieving equity to end HIV. But HIV is still here, but we've stopped talking about it. So we're going to dive into this conversation today. I have two dynamic panelists. You're going to meet them in just a few minutes. But let me start with introducing myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Yvette Anderson, and I am the Black Health COVID Disparities Grant Manager. Now, why is that important? Well, COVID, as you know, we've been impacted by COVID in our communities. Just last week, there were over 2,600 new cases of COVID diagnosed. It's important. Right now, we're in the middle of holiday season. We're going to be having gatherings with families and friends. We've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to make sure that we're wearing our mask. We've got to make sure we're washing our hands, social distancing. If you feel like you may have had an exposure, definitely get tested so you can know what your status is. If you do test positive, remember there is treatment available. So we want to encourage you to stay safe, stay healthy, but have fun, enjoy the holiday. And that's what we got to do, guys. So we got to make sure we're good. All right. Well, first of all, Welcome to Black Health's World AIDS Day virtual event. We want you guys to tag and share because we want to get this information out to as many people as possible. And if you'd like to see future programming like this, let us know. Remember, we are Black Health, the National Black Leadership Commission on Health. All right. So, hey, what's going on, guys? Today we have... Scott Solomon, he is the outreach extraordinaire. He is the man in Harlem. And I'd be remiss if I, died, if I didn't mention Maria Davis. She is AIDS activist to the 10th power. But these are my peeps, y'all. These are my people. I have known the two of them probably about 20 years. They've been in the Harlem community doing the daggone thing. HIV awareness, outreach, education. I mean, everything. So I'm going to give them a chance to talk about who they are and what they do. Then we're going to dive into this conversation because as we talk, you understand why their passion is very important for the work that they do. And let me just say, they have kept me motivated to do this work. So we're going to start off with Maria. Maria Davis, welcome to the stage. How are Hi, you? Hi, Yvette. Hi, Yvette. How are you? I'm Married wonderful. woman. <laughs> oh, you put my, see, she put my business out here on Facebook streets. It's all good. It's all good. Okay, she ain't married. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm married. I'm married. Happily married. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Maria. And Scott Solomon, what's going on, my brother? Not much, not much. Everything is good. It's good to see you guys. First of my first time live on Facebook. Yes, you've been really? live on first time? I ain't seen you in a while. Well, you I'm know semi that? I'm semi-retired. Oh okay. well, we can't let you we can't let you retire right now. No, we cannot. Not we can't now. let you retire right now. We need you still in the fight to do this work. And so you know, as long as I'm around, I'm gonna pull you with me. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, that's why I say semi. I'm not I can never give it up. Okay. Yeah, all right. So thank you guys for being here to honor World AIDS Day. We're talking about health equity. We're talking about HIV. And one of the things that we realize is that people aren't really talking about HIV that much anymore. What are your thoughts on that? No, they're not. It's, it's, I'm, I'm going to coin this phrase, but it's not for me. It's from uh, one of my mentors that I appear at the National Black Leadership Commission on Health, my Staten Island family, uh, Antoinette, Pastor Antoinette. Uh, she says AIDS, HIV and AIDS is a forgotten virus. Mm -hmm. And it's very sad to say, with all this going on in the world, 
You know, nobody's talking about HIV and AIDS. You know, COVID took the forefront of everything. So AIDS, HIV and AIDS, we, 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 we really need to get busy about HIV and AIDS because people are still getting infected and we still need to push testing, outreach and education. Absolutely. And that's why the work that we're doing is so important. We need to make sure that we stay on the front lines to make sure that HIV is not forgotten. Scott, did you want to chime in on that piece? Really, Yeah, you know, it's definitely not talked about enough. And I know we're going to hit on some of the other issues of why. But um, I think one of the, the, the things, too, is that we have did a good job. I mean, it's been a long road and by no means by me saying this, we did a good job that it's over. It's just that we, we've, we've accomplished some things and there's some things we have to keep, keep pressing because nothing happens overnight. Exactly. So let me just start off here. Both you and Maria are living with HIV. Yes, I've been living, I was uh, diagnosed with HIV in 1995 and then with AIDS three years later in 1998. So uh, I want people to be clear, though, everybody that has HIV doesn't have AIDS, but to have AIDS, you had to have HIV. And so HIV, AIDS is more advanced HIV. That means we uh, have gotten uh, opportunistic infections. There are 26 of them. I had MAC, Mycobacterium avium complex. I had PCP pneumonia, pneumonia you do not want to get. And I've also had some other health disparities like uh, cellulitis in both legs you know, and some other issues that went on. But uh, Mac is the one that tried to take me out of here, but thank God I'm still here. And, you know, I have two children. Both my children do not have HIV. They were not born with HIV. And awesome. uh, my son just turned 40 and yes. my daughter's 33. And I have two grandkids, which I never thought I would. If you told me that back in 1998, uh, when they diagnosed me with AIDS, I'd have been like, you crazy. And yeah. Uh, I'm not going to see anything. It was a very different conversation at that time, wasn't yeah. it? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Very different. Yeah. Medications were different and everything. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We're going to talk about medications in just a minute. Esca. I mean, yeah, um, I've been positive since 1990, you know, and um, being this world age today, you know, you start reflecting. You know, that's 33 years. And someone had told me once that um, yes. I've been positive longer now than I've been alive. You know, from one to 30, I was negative. Now, 63, I've been positive longer. Um, and, and it's been one, it's been a ride. You know, it, it's really been a ride. And I know something that Maria had brought this up because she's one of the people that always helped me as long as I've been positive longer. But she talked about a lot of those other comorbidities, those yes. other diseases. You know, those are the things with overall health that exasperate HIV. Well, that's what HIV is. It makes so you can't fight other things. So it's about, you know, it's about finding out a few positives, but being healthy overall to stop these other things from affecting you. You know, overall health, I mean, I can't, you know, I, I thought maybe COVID would raise everybody's awareness about overall health, but it um I don't know. Seemed like it's going just like it was going out to win on that, so let's forget it. Well, one of the things that you one of the things that you both mentioned was you found out you had HIV at an early age. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the lifespan probably wasn't considered um, to be a very long time. Well, my and so lifespan was 18 that, months. And, and, and because of that, what we're seeing and what we've, and what we've seen is the aging process in yes. living with HIV. And so a lot of this might even be new. And so what you've discovered too is, and as we talk about HIV being more of a chronic illness, is that life happens. And as you live life, you get older, and then you yes. deal with some of the other factors that impact health as you age, right? So um, I think that that's going to be something that we're going to focus on at another time. We're going to talk about aging through that process and living with HIV. But it's, that's it's a, one thing I want to share. And with COVID, I think people get better understanding with this. You know, we have great medications and, you know, we have great treatments. But what I always share with people is that you never know that treatment might not work for you. 
Even though we have some of the best treatment in the world we've developed over 20 years, just like COVID, the virus mutates. So it's not like we got this great medicine. You could do this. This medicine don't work for you. You will still die. And there's always a chance that this medicine might not work for you. And we're going to talk a little bit about medication and the advances that we've come through, lived through this process of persons living with HIV and being on treatment, U equals U. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But one question that I had for both of you was, when you discovered you were living with HIV, was that a hard conversation to have with your family members, your loved ones? Absolutely. I'm going to say absolutely. I first told my sister and a good dear friend of mine named Deirdre Fisher Kemp. Mm -hmm. uh, I told them both first. But everybody else, I was telling some crazy uh, story like my good friend Deidre Tate. She never let me forget. I used to tell her I had like a very rare uh, yeast infection. She was like, girl, what kind of yeast infection is that? What's that, that mean, right? Right, yeah. right. She was like, that, you you look, you 95 pounds. What kind of yeast? I said, girl, yeah. it's a mean one out here. You don't want to get it. So in the mm. beginning, I didn't want to tell anybody. And I was in the music industry. I yes, I was just going to mention that. I showcase artists. I mm -hmm. had the opportunity to be on Jay-Z's first album, Reasonable Doubt. Uh, I've had the opportunity of having artists like 50 Cent, Missy Elliott, 112, uh, Mike Epps, anybody you could think of grace my stage. Because at that time, we were all growing and we were all trying to find ourselves. So the, the new artists that didn't have a platform used my Mad Wednesday platform. So when mm -hmm. I found out I was HIV positive, I had my showcase Mad Wednesday. And right. many people did not know. I didn't tell anybody. Everybody noticed that I was losing weight. So the word on the street was I was sniffing cocaine. Yeah, that I was doing drugs. Yeah. Nobody ever came to me and said, listen, I don't want to get in your business, but I, I, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. I know you might not want to share your information or what's going on in your life right now, but I'm praying for you. And if you need anything, nobody ever, a few said it, but not many. And because, so, Maria, during that time, most people associated HIV with men who have sex with men or intravenous drug users. And prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's sex they, workers. That's what they, sex workers. Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't even know the sex, sex workers had the lowest numbers in HIV because they work. <laughs> so you're not trying to get HIV. And they know the little tricks in the mm -hmm. trades, how to put the condom on without themselves. the person knowing it. Exactly. All them little techniques I learned later, they were more advanced. The uh, our, uh, uh, I don't want to use that word, but our our street women and prevention techniques. They knew prevention techniques before we did. Yes, because they had to survive out there in the street and not get infected. Exactly. So we were the crazy ones, not 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 the street folks, but we were the crazy. Right, and as got. Yeah, it was it was very. It was very hard. Can I tell you a little quick story? And I, uh, I, I, y'all probably both heard this story, but um, you know, I was a, a high school football player football here in player. New, York, New York City. Then I went away to college, and I'm playing football. So I was, I was heterosexual male. I'm running around <laughs> playing football. So in the '80s, and there's a lot of drugs and crack in New York, as we know. We could sniff cocaine on bars. I mean, it was really, it, it was a trip, and. The message was wrong. I did not need to take a test because I wasn't shooting IV drugs. I wasn't sleeping with men. You weren't a part of that no demographic. I don't need to take an HIV test. It's yeah. not. That's what I was told. That was, was broadcast on the news. So I didn't worry about anything. I kept up my promiscuous behavior. And I took the test because I wanted to date a nurse. So I wanted to prove to her I was negative. So surprised when the results came back. And that's, um, it was, you know, it was almost, it, it's hard to describe. It was almost unbelievable back then, like Marie was saying, because you were looked at like a pariah. We had our only, we had our own small community. You were so afraid to tell people because I've heard horror stories. I remember people actually got murdered over sharing their status. Uh, and things like that. 
So, but uh, I was grateful. You know, I had people like Maria. We had our own little community. If yes. you ain't love us, we had to love each other. That's right. And I had a good, I had a strong family. You know how mama's boys is. My mama, she she like, uh, what you got, boy? Tell me what it is. We're going to help you. <laughs> so, you know, I had I had a good family behind me. Um, that's what got me through it because it, it it's almost hard to describe. It's unbelievable. On top of crack and the HIV and what was going on in the United States that time is almost it's almost indescribable what right. it was like. It was really uh, something to see. And there but, was a moment um, when you were talking where you you kind of joked about it. And then I saw your disposition change. And I'm sure it had to be sort of traumatic for you both um, getting that information, you know, and, and having to live through it having to let that resonate with you well, well you know one thing I want to smile I can smile because there was yeah. a very powerful woman when I was diagnosed I found out through a life insurance policy mm -hmm. so I took the life insurance I wanted to take a policy out for a hundred thousand dollars if anything happened to me that my two kids mm -hmm. were taken care of but the requirement was you could not have HIV or AIDS and you could not have cancer. Mm -hmm. So when they said to me, take the test, I was like, and, and the crazy part was the person that was would be my insurance man was my friend. Mm -hmm. And so when he said, take the test, I was like, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And the, it came back, paperwork came back, letter, sorry, Ms. Davis, sorry to inform you that uh, we cannot approve your, uh, you know, your life insurance policy, but we need to tell you that you've tested positive for the HIV antibody. And this was your friend. Yes. But no, my friend didn't know oh, because okay. he didn't receive the letter. I received. And for years, he didn't know. Isaac, he worked. That was my brother at, at Sylvia's. And mm. years, he didn't know. And I finally told him. But it was what. So I waited. I waited for about three weeks because I was in a relationship. And then I finally said, I have to go and find out if I really have HIV. And I went in, my partner went in with me. And this is not the same partner that gave me the virus. This was somebody I wanted to marry, thought I was moving to, to you know, the West Indies and all that kind of stuff. And um, and he went in for, I said, oh Lord, let him get, get his answer first. And he came out, I'm negative. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm negative too then. If you negative, I'm negative. Because we would have an unprotected sex. And when I walked in that room, that lady said, uh, do you want him to be in the room with you? And I said, absolutely, because I, I didn't know she was going to spring that on me. Mm. And she said, Ms. Davis, I'm sorry to inform you, you do you are HIV positive. She shut the door and she said, I'm not supposed to do this, but I am going to pray with you because you're going to need those prayers on your journey. And that woman prayed with me. And I, if I could see her today and thank her today for her prayers, because I am here 30 something years later. And I remember that story, Maria, and mm -hmm. just as touching as it was then it is now, I just got goosebumps with that. Um, you know, our communities of faith and the power of prayer, absolutely. And I just wanna shift a little bit to how treatment has advanced with HIV. And I know, Scott, you were talking earlier about um, treatment might not work for everyone, but what does your treatment journey look like? And this is for both of you. Uh, my treatment easier? journey looked like at one time, 13 pills a day, getting up in the middle of the night, two o'clock, <laughs> taking a pill. Refrigerator having, with food, yeah, without refrigerator, food. Yeah, refrigerator, something called Vitex that you had to chew and it yes, tastes like Vitex. joy. Yes, oh my God. <laughs> Oh, Videx, that big one, right? Yeah, yeah that's the one that gave me peripheral mm -hmm. neuropathy. It yeah, was DDI. Right, DDI. Right. Yeah, I, can mm -hmm. that. I mean, it mm -hmm. was a trip, but the alternative was, did you want to live? Right. So right. we did what we had to do. Right. You know? With the I mean, neuropathy actually, and all. Yeah. Yeah, you set your alarm at two o'clock and you get up, you take your pill, you go back mm -hmm. to bed. I mean, that's that's what it was. Uh it was um and it it changed and got so much better over the years. Come a long way. story, yeah. Long story short, is we have one pill once a day now. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I happen to be on two pills because that's just the regimen I choose because it works for me. Mm-hmm. We have injections now that right um, the injectables right that um you mm-hmm. can get injected. You don't have to take a pill every you don't have, you don't have to take a pill every day. You know, and everybody have their opinion about that, and you know that, and that's really good. It's just for me, it's about options. Yes, and getting help. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and trusting in yourself and your provider and your information because it has gotten to the point where it seems like we can't believe anything anybody tells us. But right. you have to put all this stuff together and make what's best for you. What's mm-hmm. the best decision for you? I mean, that's how I had exactly. to live with it because, I mean, we're talking about, I guess, the best way I could put it. One of the ways I could put it, it was like, it was like COVID, but almost almost on steroids because you see, we didn't have a vaccine. It was like, here, you're right. you're infected. And they would tell you your your how long they thought you had to live. Right. You know, six months, a year. <laughs> no, you're probably and, and you had facts because you've seen your friends and people in your community dying like that. So, you know, um, um you know, I want to thank all the providers. And healthcare workers yeah. and, and peers like Maria, nurses, because, nurse, yeah, oh, oh, I, I always forget to thank oh them. Oh my God, I mean, we can never forget the nurses. Oh yeah, my yeah. God, I had some incredible nurses through oh, my journey. Oh God, I had some people over the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and also thanking you, Yvette, because you were one of the first per- people I met. Mm. Marlene Taylor was one of the Janice. Shout uh, out, Janice. Yeah. Wide is one of the people that I've met. Yes. Michelle Lopez. Shout you out know, to Gloria all the Stinson, soldiers. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Mack. Oh my goodness. Geraldine. And you know what? It really is a small world because yeah. all of those people that you mentioned, I know all of them have relationships with all of them. And it's so important. It's so vital that as we move forward and do this work, we are a community. And that's the great thing. That's the beauty in what it is we do. So we get to see the changes. We get to see the evolution of yeah. how yeah. we have Sorry. progressed through this illness. And so as we revisit again, health equity in HIV, and as we look at and treat HIV as a chronic illness, it's kind of changed the way that maybe other people who might not be directly impacted, think about it. Even with the increase in new infections, So people are thinking a lot of times, well, I can just take a pill, I'll be fine. Or with PrEP, oh, I can just take a pill and I'll be protected. And then that moves me to you equals you. What are your thoughts on... Undetectable means Undetectable means and transmittable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was really... Through sex. Through sex, right. Right. Thank you for that, Scott. Right, through sex, right. And and we still can get infected, even though it says uh, undetectable means untransmittable. I ain't still trying to jump out here in the dating world and not use a condom because right, I yeah. know what I have, but I don't know what the other person. Listen, right, there are other things people, we could take people at their word. There but are if other you're not things with somebody out there. Twenty four hours a day, mm-hmm. I cannot vouch for no one but Maria Davis. That's and, right. And, and I think it's worth. I think it's worth repeating. You know. HIV weakens your immune system and you die from other things. So you might have the HIV medication, but you're going to get sick. Your body won't be able to fight off something that it normally could. Mm-hmm. So that's the danger. Oh, if I got HIV, I got the medication. Yeah, right. but you it's not that simple, you know, because as we get older, you know, I know me and Rhea could share with you. That's the issue. It's not the HIV right now. It's the other the thing that my body might can't the fight challenges. because I have HIV. Correct. And that's why it's so important that we look at health, not just in the microcosm, but we're looking at the total picture of well-being, health, how it is we manage ourselves, how we take care of ourselves, how we eat. Our diet impacts us tremendously. Water, water. Uh, drinking water. Yes, absolutely. Attending your appointments is yes. so important. You know, And, and taking just, your medicine on time. Taking your medication on time. Yes. And I'll be yes. honest with you. Jules. Um, I, I didn't do it like I was supposed to be because we had was hitting on it earlier, but the, the mental health and the social aspect, I might've didn't use as many professionals that I would use now 
because we didn't have them without people like you, Yvette, Maria, and just the structure. Because okay, you go to I, I was pretty good because I'm a work, I've always, you know, been had jobs and was kind of regiment. So I'm always able to listen, take direction, listen to my medicine. But I would have went crazy without my family and friends. I would have lost my mind. First of all, you tell me I'm gonna die in two years. Now I can't get a wife. What am I to do about my children? I would have lost my mind. I, and I know people that killed themselves. So without that other support and that that mental health support, I still wouldn't have made it. You know, that's one part that we can't we can't forget that, you know, you need support. And of course, we know it's hard for black men. You know, we struggle with that. But, um, you know, you know, you, you need that support. I, as a black man, struggle with getting support, get reaching out for support all the time. And, and that, you know, and, yeah, go ahead, Marie. I'm sorry. And, you know, also we were educated by y'all. I didn't know what the difference between a T cell and mm -hmm. a viral low was. I didn't understand the importance of having a lot of T cells when I had three T cells that I was going to die. And I was still modeling and doing, you know, covers of, of heart and soul and all that. But my body, my immune system was done. And after I did that cover heart and soul, I wound up in the hospital with, PCP pneumonia. PCP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it doesn't matter how cute you are, how beautiful you are. When you're sick, you're sick. And so, but if you're not educated, I was also okay. able to help myself, heal myself because of the education that I got from you, from Deborah Levine, from uh, Deborah Frazier Howes, from National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, which is now National Black Leadership Commission on Health, Melissa Baker, you know, and 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 see Virginia Fields and all of the people, you know, Roberta Ross, God bless with Black she Health. Passed, yeah. Rest in peace, you know, oh, and all yeah. of the other people, you know, uh, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't forget uh D Bailey, who's now with Watchful Eye. You know, all of these entities. All of the soldiers. Yes. yes. All of these all the soldiers, pioneers in this fight. Yes, all these and Myron, Myron. What, what's and the it man? Does, it does Myron, take it does take a village. Myron Gold. Yes, Myron Gold. We cannot forget Myron yeah, no. Gold. Yes. You know. Yeah. And um, yeah, the thanks, bear. Maria, for reminding, reminding me of some of these people because yeah. you know I forget. And you know, you Ed undetectable Shaw. means untransmittable is just another tool, and it's a great tool to have. It's just something to be careful with. Now I'll be honest because it's like, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't get you infected by my semen, but I can still get you infected by my blood. Yes. So let's be clear, you know, but it's a great tool to have. Don't get me wrong, because we, I mean, we didn't even know for a few years that we weren't, we couldn't transmit the disease because we, we sure were not. That's right. We were taking the, we were doing the right thing and not transmitting the disease, but we didn't even know. It took the scientists a couple of like 10 more years, right, really five more right. years to find yeah. out that we couldn't transmit it. But we knew we were undetectable long before we found out we couldn't be, transmit it. And, but it's and just talked careful. about the value of it, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Because one of the things that we've seen is, so for a person who is living with HIV, it's possible to have a healthy baby for a yes. female Absolutely. to give birth. Absolutely. You know, um, one of the people that we've seen, a few people, but I, I don't want to mention any names. I know she she's publicly out, but some of the people who were born with HIV yes, and they went yes, on to grow up yes. into adulthood and start families. And so I think mm -hmm. a few of you, I think you both know who I'm uh, making a reference to, but yeah. you know, that's been amazing and impactful, but it also helps us to keep things into perspective. You know, we've come a long way with the advances in HIV and treatment and therapies um, and just learning the importance of taking care of ourselves and making sure that we get a chance to experience aging, experience those things that come along the spectrum of life. And I'm, I'm happy to know that we're all here and that we're all doing well and we're taking the steps to do what we need to do, no matter what chronic disease or illness we've been impacted by. Um, so, uh, we talked a little bit and we were mentioning a couple of the people who are no longer here. And it made me think about Ed Shaw 
Yeah. And I got a little bit sad about that because wow. Ed, Ed was the sure. first person that I met who was in the fight. Um, my first conference in Albany and he walked up to me. I guess I must have looked frightened or whatever it was. I looked, this was my first conference in Albany. And he walked up to me and he introduced himself and he told me what he did and he made me feel comfortable. And I have to say, Ed was one of my first friends in the community who just embraced me and say, yeah, you a little young girl. I know you don't really know what you're doing, but I'm here to welcome you to yeah, this yeah. world and to this fight. And, you know, as we talk about COVID-19, Ed yeah. was a champion he sure with was. HIV, but then fast forward COVID. COVID. Yeah. How has COVID impacted you? I know you talked a little bit about it, Scott, but COVID. Yeah, and I want to mention something about <clears throat> some stigma, really quick little story. Now I'm going to hit right on COVID because like when I was diagnosed, my son was Ooh, that's terrible. Um, I think he was 12 or 11. Uh, and I wanted to share with him and all the family said no, because he, he, um, he had just lost an uncle. He had just lost a gay uncle and they did not want to share with him. He said, don't share your HIV status, because we don't want him to worry about you. I said, when he come to me and ask me, I'm going to throw you all under the bus because mm. that's what some black men do. I did it. He came to me and asked me. And I told him, I threw them under the bus. We was okay. We understand why they wanted to do it. Let's fast forward 30 years. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell my son, my, I want to tell my granddaughter that I'm HIV positive. She's, a, she's old enough. She's a teenager. No, he don't want me to tell her. I'm I like, remember this is that the same thing they did to you. I remember. Right, See, and that's right. not even, that's and it was stigma. a struggle. It's stigma with love, but it's still stigma. Right. You know, it's not that I, I wanted anybody to think I wasn't gay. It wasn't that. It's, mm -hmm. This is my own family trying to protect each other. But that's stigma. That's what we can't do. I'd want, if you had cancer, I'd want you to tell me. Right. right. You know, right. To explain it to me. Let me know how I can help you. Or maybe you want me to leave you alone. But this hiding stuff and stigma. And this was one of the things that you experienced being a, a, a Black man, heterosexual man and your experience with HIV, what your family was thinking about, what your son in particular was thinking about and wanting to protect his daughter from yeah. what? Just having the information. Knowledge though, yeah. What are you protecting right. somebody what from? Yeah. Right. <laughs> what are you protecting them from? Right. What are you protecting them from? But they did it to him. That's what got yeah. me. The same thing they did to you and you got upset with it. When you got older, he came to me. And right. he said, yo, yo, you couldn't share that with me? I'm like, look, you need to talk to your mama, my, my mother, your grandparents. That was they doing. It wasn't mine. But that's, you know, that's not, like I said, I had, oh, I just coined that phrase. That was stigma with love. But it's still right. stigma. Right. You know, you're not giving somebody information, call you some protect them, information that they need. How do we know how that would have affected her and helped her? Or just, I'm not going to say help or harm. I just have a problem with not sharing information and education. Well, you know what? COVID to me was the new HIV. Sex, the second like, pandemic. Say, don't I, tell nobody I, I got like COVID. I was like, what in the pandemic. world? Or if somebody, if somebody exposed somebody, I was in a couple of situations. I said, we need to tell a person that uh, this person had COVID. Oh no, you could just say that <laughs> somebody uh, around <laughs> might have had. I said, exposed. no. Yeah. And think about it. As we're talking about in, as we're talking about exposures, we're not even talking about exposure from an intimate place. We're talking about the air that we breathe. Absolutely. So imagine the stigma of, oh my God. Well, I, I, I have was, COVID and I don't want to. I was you. very I don't say, afraid. Or who are the people that I could yeah. have exposed? But I, I was very afraid. But if you remember, because you know, we're not spring chickens here. That was Speak the thing. <laughs> right. That Speak was for yourself. Speak yourself, because I'm a spring chicken, honey. Speak Go ahead. Yourself. I knew that was going to be, I knew. I'm I a knew, little chicken, honey. I knew. I, I that's I right, that Maria. That we gonna, that's I knew our where story. I was going to right. stick it to. We're until the wheels fall off. Go ahead, but to your point. Go on, old rooster. To your point, Scott. To your point. Oh, um, um, 
in the very beginning. That's why I was telling Maria about her second pandemic. We felt the same way about COVID that we did about HIV. We didn't know how you get it. We didn't know how you transmit it. They thought it was transmitted at one time um, um, through the air. You know, we didn't know through blood, through semen, right. sweat. Right. We Haitian. did not know. Right. <laughs> remember if you were a hemophiliac oh, yeah. they had oh. all it. the yeah. green monkey remember the yeah. green monkey yeah like if you were from monkey. certain oh, countries no. in africa certain countries yeah yeah yep. yep. just like china does this sound familiar right, well, right, that's right. why i was very afraid but i was somewhat prepared because i understood the panic i understood that things change and remember we've been living this for 30 years yeah. it has changed from week to week, the, the medical providers tell you one thing in the next two weeks is something else. I didn't feel they were being slick. That's how diseases are. Well, Things the thing is, change. there's not enough evidence or information yeah, exactly. at that time. So things exactly. are going to change. That's it. And so during that process, the public trust is waning because the scientists well, don't know enough. And we already got point. trust issues. And then so. because information is quickly changing... You know, and we deal with this all the time, just in doing the work that we do. As we're doing education, we're trying to educate the communities about how we're being impacted, what the latest information is, trying to convince them, you know, we have histories of social injustice and inequities, and, and we're going to, that's going to lead us into health yeah. equity. Yes. And so as we are adjusting, making the adjustment to live and be healthy and to how is it that we move forward and still maintain our resilience and all of this you know as we're talking about health and health equity do you feel that we will ever achieve health equity in hiv or have we arrived? Is are we there yet? No, what are your thoughts? no way. Near. First of all, that's a setup. That's a setup. Yeah, is that yeah. a setup? First of all, <laughs> when you talk about HIV, HIV is not in a vacuum. It's connected to so many other things: diabetes, so many other heart things. disease, high blood all, pressure, high cholesterol, all connected. homelessness, uh, Ill illiteracy. There's so many social determinants. There's so many other things that, that HIV is connected to. And yes. to, if we can get rid of all of them, yeah, there's hope. But we have to be able to ad address every single health disparity that African Americans lead number one in mm -hmm. breast cancer. It's unfortunate. And then, you know, we get the information. We don't, we don't research. Thank God we have organizations like Iris House. Thank God we have organizations like National Black Leadership Commission on Health. We have organizations like COPE, because guess what? We would be in the freaking <laughs> stone ages because the conspiracy theories out here Ooh. are ridiculous. I yeah, remember when I first got AIDS, you know, they told me, you don't have AIDS. Mm. It's mm. Some, something going on with your immune system and this. Yeah. I said, whatever is going on with my immune system. Government trying to kill us off. On. Whether it's HIV, whether I, right. I'm not a scientist, but I know if I don't take this medication and I don't eat healthy and I don't take care of myself and exercise and I don't think positive and I don't reach for my faith, I won't be here anymore. You know, so all you, of those that the, all of that in a in a in a in a bowl is what has to happen mm -hmm. and love learning to love, having compassion, you know, not, not worrying about the next person having more than you. And if you have, and that person doesn't have sharing with them, even information. I met a young boy, a young man in the park. He was having problems with his legs. His, his leg was all messed up. And I said, well, what are you doing about it? Oh, they moving me around here and there. So I started calling around, getting information to help him. And we'll call him and give him, give him information. He and don't have know, HIV. But that's key, Maria. Resources. I have a resource and that, that he's is not, key. he doesn't have. And that's how we help to heal our community. And, and I know there's been a few people like me and Maria and you, Yvette, who like, um, we, um, we, have one of our avenues was trying to improve health equity surrounding HIV. So when the COVID pandemic hit, we see all these articles, how there's no health equity. 
It was like, this is amazing. We've been telling you, you this know. for 30 years. We've been telling How you. Long? But now. It was almost oh, ironic, wasn't it? Now there's no help. Right. There's no help. The that cat was let out. Wow. The yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so just to throw in here wow. really quickly, um, I had a comment about health equity is trending now. Mm. across all sectors mm. everybody is on the health equity bandwagon oh, yeah. and i'm not even saying it to be facetious but it's almost like it's a trend oh there's no health equity or there is health equity oh we're certainly now we're aware of all of the injustices that have been impacted on communities of color but that's we've a always great been sound aware. bite that's a great sound bite. yeah but do we've you always been aware saying? absolutely right so now what do we do about it and so there's the fight for funding in these areas where people are vying for these opportunities to grandstand. And, you know, again, I don't want to sound like I'm not grateful because I do understand that there's some people who have arrived at the table and they really do have good intentions. And so what does that mean for us? Like, as we talk about health equity, is that something that we can really achieve? And if so, how yeah. do we get there? Like stay in the fight because there's a there's but there's other bigger. You heard that, and Scott? Stay in the fight. <laughs> no retirement. Well, train right. people. I'm glad you said that. Stay in the fight. Go ahead. Stay, Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You ain't no good. Mm -hmm. You ain't no good. Stay, no stay in the fight and train people to take over for you because there's the bigger elephants in the room, and we know it. But there's nothing we can do about it because being around a long time and just getting older, you see certain things like at one time there was a crack epidemic and we know the reason why they blame that. Then we had a, um, a pill epidemic in the Midwest and it was totally different reason and why. Mm -hmm. One was a disease and one wasn't, you know, but it, it's about staying in the fight, you know, getting tested. I'll always be partial towards testing because I was an HIV counselor and tested at Harlem Hospital for like 20 years. But if I don't know your status, I can't test you. It just don't, I can't help you. Same thing for HIV or, or high blood pressure or diabetes. If I don't know you have it, I can't help you. Now it's gonna fester itself. So I've just always been partial to 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 testing, early diagnose. Any provide doctor will tell you that's that's what it's all about. You know, or if we could help you, it's better for us to get it early. And know. information and education really yeah. is key. And and I and also. I also, excuse me, I also want to say for yourself, be an advocate for yourself. Yes, that's important. It starts with you. When you go in the doctor's office, before you go, if there are questions that you need to ask, exactly. I Write did the I down. Design campaign Take with Merck. With and, that, and that's what it was. I Design with Campaign was about educating people mm -hmm. that were living with HIV or whatever you were living oh, whatever. with. whatever. To go the into the doctor's sense. office, write your questions down. Yes. If, there, if there's medication that is not agreeing with you, talk about it. Or if it's a doctor that you don't feel is respecting you and mm -hmm. what you and, and your needs, Speak up. change your doctor. Switch provider, exactly. Yeah. You don't and have to really stay is. somewhere because it's a clinic in your neighborhood. Right. Go to another clinic that's not in your neighborhood. So you got to go a couple of... You got to ride a train have and go downtown. Do that. If the care is better there, do it. Right. And, and working in a hospital for 20 years, that helped me tremendously. It, it, I mean, with the help of others, you know, like Maria and everybody showing me how to speak and how to talk, but working in a hospital for 20 years, because when I first started, I had the same thing. You know, you have on this white coat, you're a doctor, you know all. You know, then as I started working in high school and became friends, I'm like, they're just people who went to school, <laughs> you know, very kind and giving it, and, and, and don't get me wrong, saved my life, but they're just human beings that went to school. They got issues like you. So it's about exactly. talking, talking to them and getting that knowledge from them. And so. so that is so vital. And one of the programs that Black Health is a part of is the Conscientious Clinician Program. Mm. So oh, that's right. I like that. I like that. And yeah. educate, helping to educate clinician. the future clinicians on we how have to some best of the younger serve. ones to come out with us. Yes, that's our right. communities. It's important. We have to have these conversations. If these dialogues don't happen, if we don't bring this information 
to the ones that we're going to be placing our hand, our care in, in their hands. If we're not having these conversations, who's going to have it for us? And so we have to continue to stay motivated. We have to continue to educate. We have to continue to be, um, we have to empower those that are going to be doing the work when we yes. have retired. Yeah, no, and train and pass it on because training, that, you know, people like continue. you talk about Ed Shaw and other people. Yeah. I, I remember Ed taking me to my first plan account for me, and I could run on the names of other people, Craig Carr, right, people who just right. took me places and, mm-hmm. or just showed me how the system worked, how to stand up for myself, you know, and I, I've always tried to pass it on to to somebody else. And I, I think I did okay. I passed on to a few, to a few people out there that I know that, um, you know, you know, working hard. And you know what I want to say? You know, years ago, we used to have family doctors. The doctors look like us. Yeah. Doctors don't look like us anymore. And they come from other cultures and mm-hmm. they come from other places. And we have to, they're taking care of us. And we have right. to demand, we have a right to demand yeah. for equity, health equity. We have a right to demand that. I don't exactly. care if you're on Medicaid. I don't care if you, you got a lot of money. You have the same rights as those pe- as the people that have money too, and and I just want to say that, and we really have to encourage our young people to go for jobs like being doctors right. and medical right. practitioners. Exactly. We are losing a whole African American community to other communities that don't that that are picking up the torch, and then you know we complain, but we can't complain because we're not going for those jobs. You know, everybody want to be in the music industry. Everybody yeah, wants or, to or be an influencer. Player. But yeah. who are you influencing? Right. You're influencing the people that don't matter. Influence your community. And Get, so, you know, be, go ahead. I'm sorry. we need to have these conversations because yes. it is important for us to light those torches and in encourage our young people to go into these areas that we may not have had other many of us enter before it's important because as we're moving forward just to encourage them to let them know yes we do have the power yes we do have the capacity to move forward and we definitely want to as we're empowering our youth as we're empowering our community younger community members, we want to make sure that we let them know that yes, yes, you can. We can do this. We can stay in the fight. We can do better. We are and have to be responsible for our wellness. So we're going to be wrapping up in just a second, but I also wanted to just pause to do a station identification. Remember, we are Black Health, the National Black Leadership Commission on Health. And we want to encourage you to tag and share and like if you are Black Health. That's right. See, everybody has on the Black Health shirt except for me, but it's all good. It's all good. We um, forgive you. That's why we wore ours. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate it. Take it out. Look it out for each other. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we definitely it. want to do more programming like this. And so if you would like to see more programming like this, definitely let us know. But we also want to open it up for que- if there are any questions. Does anyone have any questions as we're going to be making our closing comments? This, is, this gets the hard part. I don't now, even if we, if we, if we said is. we yeah. had Jay Z tickets, <laughs> we'd be full of questions like, where do we get them from? <laughs> <laughs> right, but and you know, I also want to, I, I also want to take this opportunity. I also want to take the opportunity to say, please get involved in voters' engagement. I'm not telling you what party to be a part of, but what I'm telling you is be active in your community. Community Definitely board meetings you need to go to. Mm-hmm. If Black Health says we're having a, a health forum, be a part of it. You know, if, if the if the police department, I'm a community partner with the 28th precinct, if they say we having a meeting once a month, Wednesday, go there, because then you become informed. I, I, I It just hurts me when people say, I didn't know that building was gonna be put up. Yeah, you would have known if you would have went to the right. If you would have went to the meeting. Now right. you come into yeah. after fact and you mad because the building's going up in your community, but nobody was there to say we don't want that building because we can't live in that building. 
And these are some of the ways that we need to train those that are coming behind us. Yes. Absolutely. We need to encourage them to be present. You know, your voice needs to count. Your voice needs to be heard. You need to get your vote out. Absolutely. You need to make a difference in your community so that your community can continue to flourish. And if there's an area that needs to be addressed, let's get it addressed. Find out how we can reach out to our local politicians. Um, who are we putting in office? You know, that's important too. We can affect policy and yes. change, but we awesome. have to take those steps to do that. And so these are all things that are going to help us to continue to be successful. If there's something that needs to be changed or addressed, hey, let's get on that line and let's make it happen. You know, it's not, it may not happen overnight, but guess what? If we take those steps, at least we know we're doing our part. And so Martin Luther King. That's what we have to continue. Vote is right. We have to continue moving forward. We have to continue to ensure that we will stay resilient in spite of everything that has impacted us, that has come our way. We will continue to move. We will continue to fight. We will continue to grow. The story does not end here. So as we're wrapping up, we've got about 10 more minutes. I uh, just wanted to find out from you, Maria, and you, Escott, what would you like the audience to know about how your life, your journey has been? And if you had to write your own tombstone, not to sound morbid, but your own legacy, what would you like for it to read? I would say they thought I was going to die, but God, that's what mine was saying, mm. but mm. God, <laughs> that's why I would say they thought I was going to die, but God, but also I would like, you know, get involved with however you can, any way you can, don't let your illness does not define who you are, whatever you're going through, domestic violence, you know, uh, breast cancer, whatever you might be going through. Do not let it define you. Seek help. Know that there's someone out here that is rooting for you. Know that there's someone out here that's praying for you. And know that there's someone out here that has been, that has gone through what you've gone through. That, you know, all of us have a story, but some of our stories may have different people's names, but we can identify with what has happened in our lives. And you know, don't be afraid to speak out. Don't be afraid to get help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That was the most important thing. When I was afraid to speak, I stayed sick. But once I opened up and shared and started helping other people get to the point of living as I, as well as I was trying to live, that really, you know, that's why I'm here today. So that's the important that. thing. I have my own podcast, Can't Be Silent. So on Monday, I will be talking about uh, AIDS, HIV AIDS Awareness Day. So I would, I'm inviting uh, Escott to be on my podcast. You know, I also have Mad Wednesdays. I still showcase artists where I take the opportunity to test artists at the Shrine in Harlem. You know, give my young people information. Also, I, I, Black Health. I, I cannot, uh, you know, I love my brother, Kimar. Kima was there every month with me at Shrine, testing for HIV and testing for Hep C and giving out information and condoms. I can't keep condoms at the Shrine because every time I fill a bowl. And that's I, a good thing. Everybody takes them, and, and especially the African community, which right. was a hard community for me to right. tap into. Same so because care. I've yes. been there so long, yes. I'm able to get them tested. I'm able to say to them, listen, to my bartender, Abdul, listen, I need those five guys over there. They take condoms from me every week. Can you get them to get tested? And because he says it, they go down and get tested. And education is Educa so And networking, mm -hmm. getting partners that may not look like you, but stand for the same and thing. And network, yes. Go ahead, it, Scott. It has really been a unbelievable journey. I just wanted to mention one more thing about equity and health care. Like it's all these things, it's financial, it, 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 it's, it's equipment, it, it, it's a lot of things, but so sometimes it's also the interactions. I mean, I, I, I'll i never forget having to translate between two guys that spoke English. 
a, a, a white doctor working at Harlem Hospital and a brother living in Harlem. I had to sit in the meeting to translate because they couldn't understand each other. Each other. You know, wow. that's equity where you have to get somebody you know you understood. The doctor didn't even know that the guy was just yes in him and the guy not understanding. He don't even want I'm like, did you understand what you said to you? No. You know, that, right. that's health equity. You have to get those type of things out of the way. It's been an incredible journey. And it's like, you know, it's some real simple words. This coach that we used to, we used to all watch in North Carolina State, he died from cancer. And he had said, it is real simple. It's just never give up. Just yeah. never, never give up. I mean, the simplest you can get. Because, I mean, I, I know we're talking 20 and 30 years later. But imagine how we felt when they sat across the table and told us that we have HIV. And you probably, I think they told me probably in two years. So this is 1990. I'm 30 years old. So you're telling me I'm going to, in two more years, I'll be dead. And just the resiliency of my friends and my family, I just refused to, I don't know, I guess just we hard hit. I refused to die. And remember this, no. your energy and your life force really That's does right. make a difference in it how it is you move through this yeah. thing called life and the impact that you have on um, not just yourself, but others. And so I think this is a great segue into if there are any final questions from the audience, please drop it in the chat. But you guys are phenomenal and it really is my pleasure to be here on this platform with you all doing this work together um you both know that for many years we've done at various levels uh work at black health and um, whether it was testing or outreach or conferences mm -hmm. education oh. all of those things so it's been really around a little is, bit right <laughs> yeah it really is exciting to continue to do this work yes absolutely um again remember guys if you're watching this program Remember to like, tag, and share. If you'd like to see other programs like this, give us a chat, give us a shout out, let us know, call us, reach us, Instagram, Twitter, whichever social media platform you're on, reach out to Black Health. Tag us if there is a health disparity or if there's a topic that you'd like to see us engage with but we're excited to do this program and we're excited to be here today to honor to commemorate and to recognize world aids day I well i want to give you got maria i want to give some shout outs because i got my facebook up here so my aunt joanne is watching joyce mcdonald said awesome orbit clinton said tell the hey, story orbit. share it don't spare it uh <laughs> Um, my good friend Tashana Pace over at the um I know Miss Pace. I'm actually yes. about to go meet with her next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So uh Hamilton, Drew Hamilton community. Drew Hamilton, Center. that's right. Tell, director. Hi, Miss Pace. We're gonna be there in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> forgive me for interrupting you. I just wanted to no, shout people out that why and then Orbit gave a big okay sign. <laughs> yeah, I got a couple of texts too. Yeah, that was cool. Okay, so you guys are always superstars. Yeah, you Any honorable too. mentions? Go ahead, go ahead, you Scott. No, nah, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence, and just all that. You know what? Really, it, 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 it. So many people has been involved in the fight. Yes. Sometimes I um, I, I forget so many of them. You know, there was a brother who um, you know, I remember when I got diagnosed um. There was a brother who named Clayton who took me from my diagnosis to a meeting. And I remember none of that. I just remember being over a, a conference table the summertime in Harlem. She telling me I'm HIV positive. For the next week, I was in the days. I think I was with him for a week. It just got me over the hump. There's been so many people. And that's part of, that's part of what, what but, has helped me to give back because I didn't see this as a career. You know, I went to college, I had other aspects and I didn't go into it just because I was HIV positive. 
Uh, I guess that had something to do with it, but it was just, I seen such compassion and how people help people, you know, and, I, and I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about people, like one of y'all had mentioned from all walks of life. I'm talking about white people, my doctor, when I first got here, my doctor was from Africa. She's working yeah. at Harlem Hospital, her name was Jasoba Wally. <laughs> and just so much love, because we didn't have a lot of treatment. She gave right, me a lot right, of love. Right. She couldn't treat me, Absolutely. but she gave me a lot of love and she gave me a lot of hope. We got 30 you know? seconds. Oh, so. you know what? You know what? We actually got about 10 seconds left. We you love you. I love, love you. Both. I love you. I love you. See you Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. You guys are amazing. Thank you for spending World Day, well, a part of World AIDS Day. With right, because we're going to be out health. screaming all you know, day We're going to be out all mm -hmm. day doing the daggone thing. Absolutely. But again, we're Black Health, the National Black Leadership Commission on Health. If you'd like to see additional programming like this, please let us know. Thank you. Please remember to tag and share and also continue to stay in the fight. Yes. And thank you so much for watching us. I'm Yvette Anderson and we are out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. Maria, so you said Wednesday is back on. No, Monday. At the Shrine. Yeah. At the, okay. Oh yeah, I've been at the Shrine. So I, the next one I have is a uh, December 21st, I'm raising toys. For, oh, that's sounds uh, cool. Okay, yeah. you see me, girl. But I I'm want right. you on Monday. I want to put you on Monday on my show. You going to send me a... Yes, I'll send you a link and everything. What it's time? five to seven, five to seven. Okay, I'll make sure I won't take no work shift. I'm not working so far that day. Okay, I could always do it at work, but yeah, what please, everybody. Kind of <laughs> I'm sitting at the desk for housing works in Bailey House. I ain't doing that. Oh, nothing. you were lynchers. Yeah, yeah. I'm just been there burning down the building. I'm in Brooklyn and other places. Oh, and sometimes I get to Louis Place on 130th. Mm. Mess me up sitting there.